Good morning and afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wildland Fire Information and Technology 2018 Fire Season ITSS webinar. This is the first of two webinars we'll be doing this year. Have a great agenda set up. We'll move on to our next slide. Uh, our topics and presenters, my name is Paul Jalovi, been an ITSS for many years, CTSP for many before that. Um, move on to Eric Torres, who will give us a introduction and purpose for having this webinar. The ever looked forward to seasonal outlook from Brian Henry, the Assistant National Program Manager for Predictive Services at NIPSI. And back to Eric for a status of uh, national initiatives and FireNet. Eric will also talk about uh, what's happening with the FTP site, telecom emergency response teams. And then we'll move on to Kevin Hoffman to bring us up to date on training, priority trainee list, and the position taskbook. Kevin will continue with the EI suite update, equipment rentals, and uh, Jennifer Ward will close up with incident IT security. If you have any questions, what we'd like you to do is type those questions in. If you look on the upper right of your screen, you'll see a little orange left arrow. That opens up a control panel, and it's a place where you can type questions. And those will be addressed at the end of this webinar. This webinar is being re recorded. Um, it'll be posted to FireNet, to our team site on FireNet. And uh, I believe that is all of the overview and introduction here. So uh, I'll turn it to you, Eric, to talk about introduction and purpose. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As Paul mentioned, this is our 2018 uh, preseason uh, webinar. It's the second one we've done. We actually did one last year and were uh, really successful on that. And, and uh, we wanted to follow up with uh, doing two webinars this year uh, one now for the GACs that are starting out early, and then one later on for, for uh, the rest of the, the Western states. Uh, we'll probably provide a little bit of different information on, on both, uh, given that some of our contracts are not finalized and there's new information always coming out. Uh, again, the purpose of the uh, webinar is to um, provide everyone just uh, with the latest information on a couple of our projects and, and also just uh, uh, remind everyone about some of the key roles and, and responsibilities of the ITSS as we go out and support our incident management teams. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. And again, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and chime in. Um, you can always send questions in later, but uh, we definitely want to get as many questions answered today as possible. Paul? Okay, thank you, Eric. I also should have noted uh, Eric is now uh, the chair of the ITSW, which is the Information uh, Incident Technology Support Work Group. So we'll move along here to Brian Henry with a seasonal outlook from Predictive Services at NIPSI. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Henry. I work here at NIPSI. And um, last year when we talked, um, we saw some pretty interesting things in the um, in the uh, data going forward. So we can have the uh, next slide here. And I'm going to give you an outlook for the upcoming fire season. But before I jump into that, uh, let's Revisit this graph that we looked at last year. The red line indicates acreage burn in a given year. Yellow line are the number of indicates the number of fires each uh, year. You can see there there's an upward trend in the data going from 1990 through the present. This data includes the fires from uh, last year. Um, meanwhile, the uh, number of fires is slowly decreasing through time. So basically, fires are just becoming larger. Something interesting to point out on this graph. A couple interesting things to point out is that now if you were to look at the years from say about oh, 2004 through present, uh, an average fire season across the United States is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7 million acres burned. Um, looking, extrapolating that backwards into the past, those are roughly the peak years that we'd have prior to that. So you can definitely see a, an interesting increase in what's occurring every several years. Last year when we talked, we talked that there was a six-year cycle merging between the biggest fire seasons, um, beginning 1988, which is not shown. The 94 was a big year, 2000, 2006 slash 2007, and then uh, 2012, and then we were thinking 2018 was going to be the next big year. And then we also were hinting that there could be like interim uh, three-year cycles embedded within that, and that does appear to be coming to fruition. Uh, 
Last year, we were expecting a busy fire year, but we were thinking that actually this year was going to be the big year, 2018. But as you can see, we burned 10 million acres last year again, uh, mostly in response to a lot of uh, fine fuels that burned across the Great Basin and in, in the Northern Rockies as well. So you can see um, coming fire seasons are definitely becoming much more significant as we go forward in time due to the uh, changing climate and the changing fuel conditions, mainly across the West and Alaska. All right. Um, so let's take a look at this year, show you where we're starting off. Um, data this early is a little bit on the limited side, but I'll show you what, what I've got so far. Uh, looking at precipitation since the beginning of the water year, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, upper left shows uh, some interesting features. I can see one thing that stands out and jumps out right away is the uh, southwestern quarter of the country, basically really from uh, west Texas all the way through California. See, since the beginning of the water year, you can see a drought cycle re-emerging. Last year, we were exiting the drought that had been going on for about six years rather rapidly due to the incredible amount of precipitation that they had had. Now that drought is expanding northward a little bit, as you can see into Oregon, as conditions have remained pretty dry over there as well since the beginning of the water year. Looking just to the right, you can see uh, over the past month, that signal has amplified over Southern California, Southern Nevada, it's become even drier, but we have started to see a little bit more moisture across um, part portions of Arizona, New Mexico, as we got some shots of moisture moving in from, Me from Mexico. So that's uh, looking pretty good there. Uh, meanwhile, up across the uh, Northern tier, Montana, Northern Idaho has been looking really good. Um, they've had an exceptional year for snow. And the reason for that is that they've had an abnormally large number of Arctic fronts dropping down out of Canada and uh, producing record to near record amounts of snowfall along the Continental Divide. Some of that's filtered over into Washington State as well. The Cascades are in good shape, at least once you get north of Portland, Oregon, and into Washington. It's looking pretty good over there as well. Uh, just as an aside, um, in Montana, they're actually having problems with that too much snow on the Rocky Mountain front. There's a boys basketball team that has not been able to return home from a tournament since just before Valentine's Day. So they've been having to find alternate places to live until they can get the 10 feet of snow off the road that's up there currently. So it's been pretty excessive over there. Uh, areas of concern right now uh, in the immediate term are basically the Texas, Oklahoma panhandle getting into Kansas, uh, where it's been extremely dry all through the winter months and continues to be so. And what's more concerning is that they're expected to continue to be dry there as well. Even though temperatures, as shown in the uh, bottom two graphs, have been generally normal or slightly below normal in those areas, um, again, that the dryness is really taking hold in those finer fuels. So when they have these fronts dropping down out of the, the central northern plains or out of the Rockies, they're getting some very dry air and some really gusty winds with that, and they're getting the occasional large fire out there as was evidenced uh, just the day before yesterday when they had a rather large fire in South Central Kansas. Okay. All right, looking at the uh, last two weeks, again, um, not too much different from what we've been looking at, except that um, you've seen a cold pattern taking hold across the West, but when you look at the uh, map that's on the right, and uh, unusually warm across the East, so we've basically seen a shift in the pattern for the first part of our second half of uh, February getting into early March from what we had been seeing the entire winter before. Prior to that, temperatures are basically much cooler than average across the east and very warmer across the west. So that flip-flop did occur, but we're about to revert back to a uh, warmer pattern across the west and a cooler pattern across the east. Meanwhile, uh, the, uh, you see the effects of the Arctic front across Montana, Wyoming, and western uh, South Dakota. Um, looking at the precip map on the left, um, Again, it's continuing dry in Southern California, getting the most of Arizona, still getting some uh, precip along the state line, Arizona, New Mexico, but those, the western part of the Southern Plains, again, very dry, um, of significant concern, even maybe of more concerns, actually the flooding and uh, parts of uh, on the Mississippi River Valley where they've gotten anywhere from about 600 to 1,000 percent of normal precipitation, uh, which is just incredible amounts. Uh, another area we're watching is uh, southeastern Georgia, getting into parts of uh, Florida as well. They've started showing a bit of a dry signal, but even though they've received um, very low precipitation over the past couple weeks, they're still getting periodic shots of moisture. They're keeping that, uh, those dry conditions from getting out of hand like they did uh, earlier last year. Looking at snowpack, what a difference a year makes. Uh, total, con total contrast. And, uh, 
March 1st, 2017 versus March 5th of this year. Looking back at last year, we had that record snowpack um, across the Sierras, getting into parts of the Cascades and across the Great Basin. Uh, last year, across the Northern Rockies, Washington State, uh, normal to slightly above normal snowpack was received. Our thinking was that that was going to delay the start of the fire season in the higher terrain, which it did in most areas except for the Northern Rockies because that ended up uh, melting off very quickly in July and they had a normal start up that way. Uh, looking at this year, um, what you see in Oregon for the snow water equivalency up there in these basins is actually better than what it was showing two weeks ago. It was entirely red uh, pretty much all across Oregon down through the Great Basin and then down to the southwest where it remains red. So they are showing some improvement in the snowpack in the Cascades across Oregon and then also get into the Sierras as well. And they will continue to show improvement for the short in the short term, maybe next week to week and a half. So they may get closer to normal. So that's good news for them. Across uh, the Rockies, again, you can see the uh, well above average snowpack. Uh, it's a record snowpack up that way. And then the Northern Cascades is doing fine. Um, some areas we're also monitoring up in the higher elevations across Nevada. And in the Four Corners region, uh, the snowpacks there are give or take are around 50% of average. So that stuff comes off earlier. We could see a little extra stress on the uh, vegetation in the higher terrain once fire season takes hold over there. So you may see more activity in the high country up there than you did last year. Um, looking at a quick look forward, um, basically this is going through next Monday. I looked at a map that just came out a little while ago that takes us through next Wednesday and it basically shows the same map. So really no need to update that. But what I want to point out is that the southern plains there is continuing to be pretty dry. There's a good bit concern about the easternmost parts of Colorado, western Kansas, the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas and eastern New Mexico. That's where the activity is going to probably be in the next three, three to four weeks and where we'll be focusing most of our attention on fighting fire over there. And as we move forward a little bit in time, that will expand westward into uh, further into New Mexico and Arizona. But um, looking at the precip, uh, again, much of the west can, will continue to get shots of moisture, which is good. That's kind of pushing back the, the uh, acceleration of the that we were previously thinking was going to happen with a fire season across the southwest. So things are going to continue to progress at a normal rate. Good news that we're seeing this is all that precipitation that you see forecast along the west coast from the Canadian border all the way down through California. That's good news. So that's going to put some moisture on those fuels as well. And uh, again, the Northern Rockies will continue to get their precip and the east will get their precip. Some encouraging signs we're seeing is across Florida and uh, southeastern Georgia. Um, they're going to be getting some more shots of moisture as well, which is going to help offset some of those very dry conditions that had been developing previous to this. Looking at the soil moisture, so let's see what's going on but beneath the snow in the mountainous areas and then what's generally going on in the soil across the uh, continental U.S. You can see the dry signal up through California and the southwest Four Corners region. Uh, very dry conditions being reflected as a result of the lack of precipitation. The pretty high soil moisture is across the northern Rockies except for northeastern Montana. Uh, one thing to point out about that is that's going to be a little bit misleading to you because that area is very much snow covered right now. So basically what this is telling us is that sitting on top of those dry soils is a, or a, or a foot or two of snow on that part, that part of the country. North Dakota, not so much snow covered over there. That's legit. Uh, so you'll probably see a burst of pre green up fire activity up there in April, more or less. And then as you green up, they'll quiet down over it that way. Um, not too you kind of suspect on that little bullseye you see over the Texas panhandle getting into New Mexico. I think soil conditions there are much drier than what's being indicated on this map. But for all intents and purposes, the soils are fairly dry across much of the West, and that will play a, uh, a pretty good role in what happens with the green up and the growth of those fine fuels, which is what governs the fire season across the basin for the most part. Across the Southeast, you can see some uh, the, the dry conditions being reflected in the soils across the Carolinas. Virginia, Georgia, and parts of Florida.
temperatures up there through the winter have been well above normal, but not so warm that it impacts the uh, snowpack. Uh, as an interesting aside, the uh, Arctic ice sheet up there near Barrow did not show up till December 23rd this past year, which is about a little bit over a month later than average. So that, that played a significant role. In fact, they got above freezing in, uh, around Christmas time, which was very unusual. So temperatures have been pretty warm across Alaska, but the snow is there, so we're in good shape there. One thing to point out, though, is down there around Anchorage, Anchorage Bowl area, getting the Chugach Mountains and then the Kenai Peninsula, snowpack is below average there. But we might want to keep a closer eye on that as we head towards uh, May and into June before the uh, rains show up for mid to late summer. So you might see an uptick in fire activity down that way. Southeast Alaska, below average on their snowpack, but uh, generally they're not a concern come fire season due to the higher humidities. Um, so the moisture's impact on fuels, uh, last we talked about being kind of a double-edged sword, and that's of course the case this year as well, but we're looking at it from the other side of the coin. Um, last year we talked about how all that abundant soil moisture we had around yesterday and the, last year in the Great Basin would produce an above average uh, grass crop, which would make for an above normal activity. That happened with extreme prejudice last year, so to speak. and. Uh, in the higher terrain, it would end up being a good thing overall, kind of delayed to start of the fire season up high. This year, um, the soil, as we saw, the soil moisture conditions and the moisture received is well below average. And uh, we're thinking that's going to limit the growth of those fine fuels in the uh, lower elevations, so they're not going to be as continuous. And that might actually end up helping us out in some locations. But the monkey wrench and all that is that not all the Great Basin burned last year, and there has not been a lot of snowpack at those low or elevation throughout the winter this year. So a lot of those fine fuels are still standing from last year. So it's still pretty continuous crop. And it really takes probably two full years for, uh, for heavy uh, grass growth like that to kind of diminish under dry conditions when it hasn't been burned. So we're still looking for an above normal potential in those lower elevations based on the growth from last year more so than the growth that we're going to get. So we're keeping an eye on that. And um, in the higher terrain, the lower precipitation amounts in some of the spots, like mainly across the Oregon, California, Great Basin area, and that's to be reflected in the fuel moisture in the vegetation in the timber. Uh, you might see an increase in the mortality in the trees. Uh, they might become receptive to fire a little bit sooner than average. It really all depends on what happens in the next couple of months. So looking at the effects of drought, basically. Um, reflects what we've been looking at so far. Uh, upper left, we have the uh, drought monitor. And uh, so really no surprises there. I think the drought probably being over, overdone in parts of Montana, the easternmost part of Montana, you get into Wyoming. North Dakota, I'm, I'm okay with. And uh, South Dakota probably as well. But um, so I think it's not as bad what they're reflecting, but even with our forecast and the drought outlook, they're even showing improvement in those areas. So for the most part. so. No big beef for that. But what we are seeing in is, a, is an expansion of the drought across the West. You can see that on the drought monitor, the expansion into Nevada and Northern California, the abnormally dry conditions. So it's expanding northward through Oregon and maybe into parts of the Columbia Basin, Washington. So the dryness is being picked up on by the folks that are making the, uh, the drought monitor. Again, I wouldn't be surprised to see them shave, shave it back a little bit across Northern California with the next issuance due to the precipitation that they're that they're getting currently and will be getting in the next several days. But for all intents and purposes, this is a good reflection. Um, the product I've been using over the past year that I really, really like is the US mon a drought monitor class change map. I go back and look at the past months, and it does a really good job of showing trends in drought. And for me, it seems to be more all about trends more so than actual hard values, like where are we heading? And when I look at this map, I want to look at the area, the yellow areas. Those are areas where the or yellow, orange, or red areas that's showing where drought is intensifying or expanding. Um, those are the areas that are being of more concern. And you can see it's intensifying across West Texas and getting into Oklahoma and Kansas as well, parts of Colorado, New Mexico. And then you can see the expansion in California as well and in Oregon. Um, again, these are areas we'll be watching. And uh, the gray areas are basically the status quo. So anything area that's gray or yellow are the areas that we're watching more closely, maybe it's more so than others. Green, of course, indicates improvement. Dark greens are a rapid improvement in the drought. 
So fuel day, fuels data is very sketchy this time of year. We really don't start getting reliable fuels data to at least um, late April. And, and even then it's kind of sketchy as far as his accuracy goes, but here's what I was able to, to come up with. Um, 100 hour fuel moisture maps on the upper left. Most of that data is not very reliable, except across the uh, central and southern plains. So I think it did a good job of highlighting the areas of concern across Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and southeastern Colorado. Um, it's picking up on that nicely. Other things it's not doing so well with, um, just because the fuel sites really aren't reporting in most areas just yet. Heat fire index works better across the east and southeastern portions where there's a nice deep duff layer of a, in the ground cover. Um, it's picking up on some real, really significant dryness across southern Florida. That's an area that we, again, need to be monitoring in the short term, at least for the next month or two until they really start greening up and start getting more moisture there. Thankfully, we're not looking at a long duration scenario where it stays like that for more than a couple of months like we were a couple of years ago. So that's just a short-term issue, and you can kind of see the dryness extending up across on the Georgia and South Carolina coastlines as well. Uh, across the West, this product's really not all that useful. And then we already talked about the uh, soil moisture percentiles and the uh, drought class change maps. So as we're putting the outlook together, here's what we're looking at. Uh, dry condi conditions continuing again along the Atlantic coast, or have continued across the Atlantic coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Uh, drought has developed in those areas, watching that. So these things on this slide are the, are the quote unquote, the bad things. A lot of these things are, uh, are negatives that we're looking at and are monitoring, but they're not really as dire a situations as we've seen in years past. They're just states that have our attention, but we're not super concerned about them right now. Um, even like with a snowpack across the Great Basin, we're, yes, but it's below average, but we are seeing improvement. So really what matters most with snowpack is how fast it comes off, not, not how much you have. 2010 being an example, that was a year where we had 50% snowpack. It came off at a record slow rate. We almost had no fire season at all up in the Northern Rockies. So the amount doesn't really matter at this point in time, at least not too much. Um, the long-term drought re-emerging in Southern California, Arizona, that, that is coming and they do have some carryover with, uh, with the fine fuels there as well, like the Great Basin does. But again, they also are going to be getting some precipitation here over the next uh, couple of weeks. So the outlook for precipitation for those guys is pretty good. So that might help, off, help offset that some as well. And uh, again, the soil moistures in those areas that you see here are below average. The good things on the on the next slide uh, basically shows us the uh, snowpack across northern Rockies and Washington State is looking exceptionally good. Um, so that would tend to promote, along with the data that we've looked at with uh, past burn seasons, that the fire season up there may be on the average to slightly below, below average uh, um, side if, as we go forward, assuming there's not any substantial heat events that of long duration like we had last July. But um, so. The historical day would point towards a worst case scenario of an average type season for those folks up that way. Alaska is not showing uh, any indicators for above normal potential for this fire season due to their pre existing snowpack. Uh, some of the outlooks for them for precipitation is showing above average precipitation continuing into the spring, which is good news. So I guess mosquitoes are probably more of their concern than fire at this point. This was how uh, moist it could be up there for a little while. Um, conditions are improving across eastern Montana and the westernmost parts of North Dakota, so that's good news as well. So looking at the um, wild, wildland fire outlook for June 2018, um, this is just the beginning of the western, core of the western fire season. Um, at the first of the next month, we'll have July as well, but I'll tell you what we've heard so far on that from the, from the regions here in a minute. These are the highlights. Across the West, um, we're looking at above normal potential across um, continuing through much of the Southwest into early June, as you can see indicated on the map, indicated by red. Uh, but one thing that they noticed in their uh, right, that I saw in the write-ups from our, my partners down there, is that they think that there's a chance that the monsoon, which generally shows up about the first week of July, could show up around the end of June. So it could be an early beginning to the monsoon for them, which would bring a slightly earlier than average close to their fire season. So you're going to have a period of 
above normal fire activity probably across Arizona, New Mexico, maybe up into the four corners, southern part of the Great Basin and Central Rockies, and that, but it would come to an end fairly quickly. So that's good news for them. Um, again, we have some carryover issues with the fine fuels across parts of California and into the Great Basins, and that's being reflected on the maps for Nevada and California and surrounding foothills. Also, they've got those uh, newly redeveloping drought conditions down there, which are also part of a partially could be potentially a problem as well. So we've highlighted some above normal potential for that as well. Elsewhere, uh, things are looking uh, severely normal. Across the Pacific Northwest, Northern Rockies, most of the Central Rockies, and across the east where we even have areas where we have low average uh, fire potential going on through June. Alaska, again, is the end of normal. Okay, so something different we're doing this year, we welcome feedback on that. Um, so we've split up our, into four maps. We've always done a four month outlook, but we've traditionally done a, a, a month one outlook map, a month two outlook map, and then we combine month three and four. And uh, this year, to help simplify things for us to add more clarity, we broke up month three and four because what we were running into is that we get to the shoulder seasons where one month you're in season, you're going full throttle at, at your season peak, and then all of a sudden the season ends the next month. We were having difficulty capturing that on the map, so that's why we split it up. And the main reason being for like like the August, September type map, where August you're at your peak and September is over across a good part of the West. So here's what we're looking at. So at the end of March, again, there's some slight elevated potential across Southern California, but again, our focus is across the Southern Plains and the areas you see there. Again, we have significant flooding uh, concerns across the uh, parts of the Southeast uh, due to all that precipitation that we, we saw on the map earlier. So really not any concerns there. Maybe some slight elevated potential across Southern Florida, but not enough concern to warrant putting in above average there. Moving into April, um, Snow comes off. Between that period of time when the snow comes off and the green up occurs across eastern Montana, western North Dakota, there may be some residual effects of the drought from last year, which was exceptional drought. And if they get the right kind of wind, wind event where they get 40, 50 mile an hour winds and 10% humidity, which does happen on occasion across there, they could pop some uh, big fires in the grasslands over there near Glasgow, Montana, and uh, Williston, North Dakota. Uh, meanwhile, across the central southern plains, again, in April, that continues to remain our focus, but you can start to see a western shift on the Mexican border. And then by May, pretty much all the southwest and then through the Four Corners region, you're starting to see it creep upward a little bit to the Great Basin, uh, into uh, parts of Utah. Um, kind of surprised that they didn't put uh, any in for uh, southern Nevada, but I wouldn't rule them out as well. Some above normal potential. Um, they did go with above normal in both really April and May for uh, parts of Florida, thinking that um, some of that dryness is going to continue at least until then before they get some really good moisture. And as we move into June, the northward shift begins across the west. Uh, early in the month, you'll see the above normal fire potential across Arizona and New Mexico kind of fizzle out probably by mid to late month, and then the focus recentering over the southern half of the Great Basin, and then expanding into a uh, those areas that had a lot of grass uh, last year across northern Nevada, and I get into parts of Utah as well. So although that area west of Salt Lake is mostly rock, so there's not a lot of grass over there, so that's why they extended over to Salt Lake. But anyways, California, same uh, thing follows suit there. So what we're not showing this map yet is what's going to happen during the uh, core of the western fire season in July and August. Too soon yet, but just from conversations that we've had with some of the GACs, they are expecting probably a good chance for some above normal fire season activity across the mountains of uh, Northern California and then getting into Oregon as well. Um, Idaho, Western Montana, Northern Cascades, early ind indicators, which are very suspect at best, would suggest a more of a normal type scenario as the worst case uh, for them up that way. Again, our prior main focus Again, this is probably going to be on the grassland across the Great Basin again with all that carryover in uh, Northern California as well. Um, the very first slide that I showed earlier that had the, uh, all the acreage per by year, every year we had a peak. The next year tend to be, tended to be, be a pretty good drop off except for 2007. 
and an acreage burn, and hopefully that will follow suit as well for this year because last year was 10 million acres, and it would be nice to have it dip down again. So that's, uh, I think, all I have for you. Is there any questions that I can answer for you? Uh, let me check if there's any questions on the... Nope, no questions on there. Well, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Brian. Paul? All right, thank you, Brian. Um, we'll move on now. Uh, Eric Torres will bring us uh, up to date on the status of national initiatives on FireNet. Eric? Thank you, Paul. So yeah, I'm just going to go, uh, uh, I do a lot of these presentations and updates during our monthly call, so I'm not going to get into uh, too much in-depth uh, information on any of these, just provide a general overview uh, so I can focus more on, on some of the project updates. So as far as with it, uh, still continuing to go very strong. Uh, we've set up a lot of our, uh, the framework and, and laid out a lot of the policies and governance. Now we're getting more into how do we execute uh, the plan, so how are we going to develop uh, these different uh, um, um, technical structures so we can start supporting the fields. So in, in that case, you know, how do we do the, the infrastructure development, the security, the procurement, all that good stuff that comes with IT? That's what we're really moving and starting to focus on as well. Um, from project updates, I'll give you a little bit more in-depth on, on what's going on with FireNet here in the next couple of slides. But as everyone has seen, we're definitely moving forward in the implementation of the Phase 1 and Phase 2 categories for FireNet, so that's been going really well. As far as the FireNet web dev, uh, everyone has probably by now seen the FireNet website. So that was a, a successful project there, and we're continuing to add information to that website. And, and uh, as we move forward into the future, we'll continue to use that presence in, in multiple and in different ways. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. As far as the interagency incident technology support group, that's still uh, work that's in progress. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now in regards to the reorganization of the ITSS into the ITSW and the addition of, uh, of new members uh, is, is part of that process and, and trying to bring a, a national perspective of, of uh, those type of solutions that we're looking for from the IT, IITS project. So stay tuned, more to come on that as we start uh, uh, finalizing the reorganization of the group. Uh, that, comes, that moves me right into the ITSW charter. So as Paul mentioned, this is now called, uh, so the ITSS community is now under the Incident Technology and Support Work Group, uh, uh, which is a work group under the program board under this new WIFIT structure. The charter itself has been signed, so we're official, and uh, with that we're starting to build the additional uh, governance structure under the ITSW. So uh, things that, will be, that I'll be looking at and the group will be looking at as we move forward is the ITSW chair, the role of the chair. Uh, hopefully bring on a vice, vice chair. We've been working, uh, talking about that for the last few months now, and then we definitely want to come make sure that comes to fruition. And then something that I've talked to you and talked to everyone informally about is the development of an ITSW board, which is really all the GAC representatives uh, that are out there uh, working together as a board to uh, look at all these ITSS uh, issues and then also help to govern the, the subgroups that are going to be structured under the ITSW. Yes, as a side note, I have representation from everyone, all the GACs out there except for Alaska. So if you're out there in Alaska, please consider uh, uh, putting your hat in or yeah, your hat into the uh, uh, the group and see if you can represent your, your GAC in the uh, ITSW board. But real quick, moving forward, um, as far as the FireNet website, I think everyone is already aware of it, but in case you're not, a lot of the information that I talked to, a lot of the government documents and even uh, additional information as far as the um, leadership board in, that works within Well and Fire, that information can be found on the FireNet website. So if you go to www.firenet.gov, um, you'll find the main portal, which is the slide or the, the image on the uh, top left side of there. You'll find three circles there. There's the FMB, which is the FireNet Management Board. They have a portal there where they post their notes and other information. Then we have one for WIFIT and then one for FireNet. The FireNet one is more about the project itself, uh, the, the implementation of the FireNet solution, and uh, the provisioning of accounts. But as far as the ITSS and the ITSW, uh, if you go into the WIFIT circle, you'll find that uh, you'll get to the bottom left corner. There's another uh, page there. You'll, you'll find some links at the top called WIFIT groups. If you hover over the WIFIT groups and you go down to the Incident Technology Support Work Group, that'll bring us to the uh, homepage of the ITSW. 
There you can find a variety of information, anything from your charters, membership, meeting minutes, and the group library. And then when uh, we finalize the ITSS webinar for 2018, we'll go ahead and post one, uh, one of them up there as well. So now I want to move into FireNet and give you a really brief outline of FireNet itself. Uh, there's going to be additional training for the ITSS, so I'm just going to hover over the, the main um, parts of FireNet. Again, FireNet has two uh, components. It has the front end, which I just showed you, the FireNet website, and then the back end, which is more of a collaborative tool. So uh, if you use Gmail or any other Google products, then you've probably seen uh, and, and already interacted with the FireNet type uh, uh, systems or, or uh, functionality. But here's the main uh, components of, of FireNet and how we're going to use it. It has the email component, your shared documents, the te team drive component, which is different and, and something that probably not everyone's seen and we'll train, uh, train the ITSS on coming up here in the next couple of weeks. You've got your calendaring, your instant messaging, video presence, screen sharing, and unlimited storage. So those, that's the main functionality of FireNet. But really, the main intent now of FireNet is to meet the legal requirements under uh, Public Law 113-187, and, and Jen will talk more about that in her part of the presentation. Um, for those of us, or those of you who are interested, there's actually going to be four types of accounts uh, for FireNet. There's going to be named accounts, which is the type of account that every ITSS is getting out there. A named account is where you have your own individually based account. You have your own individual login username and, and login for that. Then there'll be role-based accounts. These are uh, accounts that are going to be created based on your role, uh, either within an IMT or dispatch center. Uh, that's not going to be an individually named account. So it's, instead of being, uh, you know, Don Smith, it's probably going to be something like um, Great Basin IMT5 uh, Plants Chief or something like that. Uh, that's, we haven't finalized the, the naming structure there. So that's what a role-based account is. Affiliate accounts is basically the same thing as a named account. It's just that we have to separate the federal uh, provisioning processes from uh, everyone else, and, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. But an affiliate account is, is basically a named account just for those who are non-feds, so we'll talk about that. And a contributor account is uh, accounts that uh, are tied in uh, to our Bison Connect system. So again, more information coming up on how these work. For those of you who haven't yet uh, requested your uh, FireNet account, I definitely urge you to do so as soon as possible. We're going to start training on uh, the FireNet system, and I'd like everyone to have an account before we do that. Again, there's two provisioning processes. There's one for the federal employees and one for everyone else, what we call an affiliate account. If you're a federal employee, all you got to do is just uh, fill out the account access form that everyone's been, uh, that's been submitted. Your account will be provisioned, and it's very important at the very end that you uh, enable the two-step verification process. If you do not do that within uh, 24 to 48 hours of your account being enabled, it will be disabled. So it's extremely important that uh, you follow through on that two-step verification. Again, for the affiliate accounts, it's pretty much the same thing. You'll fill out the FireNet account. Um, you'll have to take some additional security training uh, that the feds typically take on an annual basis. There's three types, and, and you'll have some certificates that will be sent back to me as your sponsor. I will then send that information to the FireNet admin, uh, who will then approve your accounts, and your account will be uh, uh, provisioned. And then again, don't forget to do that two-step verification uh, process there. Real quick, uh, as far as the ITSSs are concerned, um, again, everyone's going to get, uh, uh, every member of the ITSS group is going to get their own FireNet account. So uh, make sure that uh, uh, you move forward if you haven't requested those. And then we are going to have a ITSS FireNet specific webinar. And right now, I'm hoping that will be a, a one hour uh, more in depth webinar on how to use FireNet. There is a lot of training material out on the FireNet website on, on how to use the collaborative tools. So we'll definitely do one just for the ITSS, which will also provide you more information on what's going to be, what's the expectation as far as the ITSS and your support role uh, of FireNet. Right now, I'm planning for that uh, um, webinar to happen next week at our monthly ITSS meeting. We haven't finalized the, all details yet, but that's uh, planned, uh, the plan for right now. So just FYI. All right, moving forward, uh, FTP. Uh, again, I'll just go through these pretty quickly. We've covered these in the past. Again, if you want to use the uh, secure FTP site, make sure that you request that FTP access uh, through NAP. Um, there, um, if, so 
and I, I think I have a link up for the map here uh, a little later. You need to use your NAP account to log into the FTP site. Uh, if you want access to certain folders uh, within the FTP, you got to look at the approving officials uh, uh, site, FireNet site, to look at the table of, of approving officials to so you can request uh, uh, the uh, right approvals from those right, uh, uh, um, oh, the right access from the right approvals anyway. So, um, and I'll talk about that here shortly. So again, if you want more information on the FTP side, you can go to their uh, website at https colon forward slash forward slash ftp.nfc.gov. As a, a reminder, it is a secure FTP site, uh, so please make sure you do use port 1021 if you're using a, a, a FTP client like FileZilla. Uh, again, you must use your FTP credentials to log into the FTP site, so if you don't have an, a NAP account, you can go to that website there, the NAP website, to request a NAP account. Um, and just keep in mind that the the uh, FTP server is uh, a secure server, um, and we also want to just remind everyone that uh, there's uh, there's a certain type of information you'll be posting should be posting on FTP, and certain information you should not be posting on FTP. It's even though it's a secure FTP site, we also need to take into account the type of uh, information we're storing within the FTP. So go back up to the FTP website for more information on that. Uh, also, if you want uh, um, to connect your your uh, device with the uh, FTP site, there is additional information out on the website for you. And then finally, there uh, just a quick uh, uh, note on uh, setting up FTP on a satellite. A lot of individuals typically have issues because of the timeouts. So if you are using a client like FileZilla, make sure you increase the timeout to up to about at least 60 seconds, so that connection does not terminate. Moving on to the uh, folder structure within the FTP side. Again, we have the CTSP folder out there that contains ITSS information. If you want access to that secure folder, please send me a request uh, and include your NAP ID, and then I'll forward that to the Forest Service Help Desk, who will then provision or, or add you to that site. Um, and then the other two are just additional uh, uh, links of where we store information. So uh, in the incident-specific data, uh, folder within the regional folder, you can store maps and QR code links. That's typically uh, up to the GIS, but just uh, FYI in case you are, you are asked. And then for secure information, you can use the incident-specific folder, your region, and then your GAC support to store IAPs, uh, 209s, and IPWs. And, and again, if you want access to that GAC support folder, you know, go back up to the FTP site, look at that table, and then request it from the specific GAC uh, uh, point of contact. Okay, moving along, as far as the uh, uh, telecommunications and emergency response team, uh, FYI, we have um, the Verizon information out there on the website, so if you have a need for Verizon cows or, or uh, any other type of mobile devices that Verizon provides for free for incident management, you'll find the pamphlet out on the um, FireNet website. I contacted AT&T just like I did last year. I talked to the director for their emergency response coordination center and I'm still waiting to hear back from them about what's the uh, national response process for them. So once I hear back from them, then I'll post that information out along with the Verizon documentation. And Paul, I think that's it. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, Eric. Quite a lot of information. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Eric or anyone else about the topics, use that little green arrow in the upper right corner, and there's a place there where you can type a message question to one of the presenters. So moving right along, uh, Kevin Hoffman will bring us up to date on happenings with the Taskbook Training and Priority Trainee List. Kevin? Thanks, Paul. Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you're located this, today. Uh, so starting with the Taskbook, uh, just a reminder, this will be our third year where we're going to have an ITSS task book. And uh, for those trainees that are out there, um, if you haven't done so, make sure that you have your task book. And also the very first page of that typically has to be filled out by your training specialist. So please be prepared um, with that first sheet filled out as well as have the hard copy with you so that the uh, qualified individual you're out with uh, can go ahead and start populating um, the areas that you get experience with. Uh, also, I kind of want to remind the qualified ITSSs out there, um, you know, we have a responsibility to uh, make sure that we are good mentors and help trainees get started. So um, just 
just a reminder to, to, make, to make that uh, experience as good as we can. Uh, moving on to the next topic, uh, we're going to be having an ITSS training here at uh, NIFSI in Boise, Idaho. Uh, right now we have approximately 24 students, so we've had a really good turnout uh, for this course. So uh, we'll be putting that on uh, the very first part of April. Uh, the next item is the priority training list. Uh, trainees who are out there, if you did so last year, um, make sure that you submit your form to, to continue being on the, tri the priority training list for your GAC. Um, that's very important to uh, get the process going to get out and get your task book started. And as, as mentioned here, that, that process is different. So just, you know, find out how, how that works within your own GAC. Uh, going on to the next item, uh, availability in ROS. Um, you know, we've gotten feedback in the past occasionally where there's been people who uh, went out to web status and they said they're available and, and they're not. And that gets really frustrating for the training center. So for both trainees and qualified folks, make sure that you keep your web status up to date. It just makes it a lot easier um, for dispatch folks. Uh, once again, the GAC priority training list. Uh, you know, make sure you're on that if you're not. And uh, the next item here is, uh, you know, <clears throat> be proactive. I know that as a trainee, it can be kind of tough to get started and, uh, uh, you know, get the synergy going within within the uh, the GAC and teams and so forth. So depending upon which GAC you're in, uh, I encourage folks to go out to the gac.nifty.gov site, you know, take a look at uh, the teams that are out there. Uh, get an idea of who the ITSSs are in in your GAC, and uh, you know do your best to do some networking and uh, start getting in, involved within the uh, the different IMTs out there. Uh, in addition, uh, there are other opportunities to work on your task book. Um, sometimes there's prescribed burns. Um, there's also uh, you know research and rescue, and also uh, occasionally there's an opportunity. Uh, within other ICS incidents. It's not just fire, you know, we also have uh, um, all hazards. So it could be a hurricane or a flood. So don't, don't, uh, don't overlook those uh, potential opportunities as well. So moving on to the next topic, uh, let's talk about EIC a little bit. Um, last season, we saw a variety of patches that came out throughout the season that were applied to 1.2.3. Um, right now, um, that 1.2.3 patch 4 is our most recent release. Uh, the EI Suite team is currently working to uh, get a release out uh, 1st of April, which would be 1.2.4. Um, that's their estimate at this point. Uh, they're hoping to do that, but if in the event that that doesn't happen, we're going to see a similar uh, situation like we had last year, where we'll have to basically uh, apply patch 5 to 1.2.3 and that patch 5 is going to have updates to the AD rates. So if you're getting ready now and you think there's a possibility you could be going out here before April 1st, I would definitely go ahead and go with 1.2.3 with patch 4. But uh, definitely be um, checking the EI Suite webpage and uh, there'll be updates out there as to whether or not there's a patch 5 or a whole new release that'll be available. Moving on to the next item, let's talk about browsers a little bit. We've definitely seen issues with uh, IE11, and uh, depending upon what you're doing, uh, especially uh, uh, doing like transitions up to enterprise and so forth, we've been finding lately that, that Chrome has definitely been a little bit more reliable. So given that we have Windows 10 surfacing much more this year, you know, we expect to have four different uh, Browsers, the Edge and IE11, which of course is part of the operating system for Windows 10. And then you also have Chrome and Firefox. So I, I would recommend Chrome if you're having issues out there. And the other thing is, even though Chrome, for instance, has the Flash embedded, it's not uncommon to uh, fire up a machine from last year. And you may find that the, the Flash version is outdated. So um, typically if you see that, you can go out to adobe.com and update the Flash for the browser, but just keep in mind that if you have some older machines, you're, you're probably going to have to update the Flash version on it. 
Um, and going on to the next item, uh, the discussion here I have for Chrome. Um, we also with EIS, we've seen some issues where clearing the cache will uh, resolve some issues that you're having. So um, keep in mind, sometimes we just have to clear the, the browser cache in, in some instances to, to get things working. Uh, the third bullet item there is the Edge browser. I've seen some machines where um, you see that really long uh, command there for the uh, loopback exception. That's so the browser can act, have access to the local host. Um, if you have a Windows 10 machine and you bring up the Edge browser and there's just nothing, you have really two choices. One is you can go ahead and tell it to bring it up in IE 11. Or I found that if you go into DOS, you can go in and run this uh, this loopback exception, and that allows the edge to run correctly. But uh, keep in mind, it does require admin privileges. So just be aware of that. Uh, the next item is upload of transition file to enterprise. I just want to remind folks that when you're at the end of the incident, if you're the last IMT that's going to be out there working with, with that database, make sure that you transition um, from you know, basically from the site to enterprise. So go into go into process as the data steward, uh, create the transition file, and then upload it to enterprise. Um, even if that's successful, um, going to the next bullet item, we want to make sure that when you're transitioning with a team or you've completed an incident, that we want to go ahead and make a, a manual backup of the database and then upload that to the data repository. Um, that, that gives us just an extra copy of that database, just in case things don't don't happen to go well with with the transition to enterprise. Uh, something we saw a lot of last year um, is the 404 error. Most of the time, that was due to Tomcat services not running. Uh, I noticed it primarily on older machines, uh, like dual core machines that were running on a, a, a lower amount of RAM loaded in the machines. I don't know if, it, if it's a timing issue with boot up, but if you're seeing 404 errors, and basically with this, you're gonna see nothing um, working with the server as well as the clients, of course, because Tomcat's not running. But if you see that, go out to the services and kick off the Apache Tomcat 6 service, and, and a lot of times that'll fix that. Uh, the next item, uh, just an update on enterprise performance. There have been some things that the iSuite team has been working on to try to increase the performance. We've seen a little bit, but not as much as we'd like at this point. So just uh, keep in mind, enterprise still has you know a lot of dependencies on having a really good bandwidth with your internet. So just just be aware that the performance is going to be pretty similar to last year. Uh, reminder on the last item we have here is uh, you saw the change to EI Suite last year, where by default we use port number 59123. That gets us around issues with port 80, especially on agency machines where there was uh, firewall, firewall policies that were blocking that port. So just a reminder, especially if you're setting up a shortcut from your clients, it's not a bad idea to put the 59.123 port um, as part of your, your URL for the clients to uh, connect to the iSuite server. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this next slide, um, I didn't put it on here, but this these uh, EI Suite updates here are, are only for the next release of 1.2.4. So this stuff will not be available until that release. But um, some items that we're seeing that are fixed that will definitely impact us in a, in a very positive way as an ITSS is uh, we've had a, a, a pretty much ever since EI Suite came out is the issue with creating a new database where we would throw a Java exception error. And we had to go through the process of restoring the initial deleted database. Well, that will be fixed in the next version. So um, that, that's going to be, you know, much easier for us rather than having to restore a deleted database. So, so that'll be fixed. Um, the other thing too is, uh, if you recall, when you're setting up an incident, there's the pull down for setting the jurisdiction. A lot of times, people would select Fed and would Fed really isn't it a, a jurisdiction it's usually uh you know us force service or blm and so forth so that's been pulled out of that drop down altogether so that we don't have to worry about that confusion anymore also at the next release it's going to have the uh the data new ad rates um updates to item codes unit ids so that will be part of that release as well um 
a fourth item there, this is a big one. We've had a lot of issues in the past where there's kind of artifacts or files and so forth that have been left around after an uninstall of EI Suite. So the uh, EI Suite developers have uh, gotten the cleanup process working much, much better. And the only folder that should remain is the uh, NWCG backups, which is pretty important because uh, that's where all of our database backups are stored. However, if you're un uninstalling EI Suite, I would never rely on that. I would highly recommend that you uh, back up um, those uh, database backups before uninstalling, just as a precaution. Uh, the next and last item here uh, with the new release is, um, you know, I sent out an email last year mentioning to folks, if you're gonna be doing a, a manual backup to make sure that you log into the database that you're gonna do a backup of. We saw a lot of issues where if you didn't do that, you would be getting reports and invoices from other databases. So that will be fixed um, after the next release. You don't have to be so concerned about making sure you're logged into the exact database you're working with. So those are, those are five key fixes that'll be coming up in the next release. And uh, I'm happy to see these get fixed. And I think it'll make our, our job a lot easier when we're working with EI Suite. Uh, let's move on to a different topic now, which is going to be the uh, equipment rentals for this season. Uh, to start out with, uh, we're going to be using uh, Windows 10 Pro for Smart Source, Hartford, and Spectrum. Uh, that'll get us up to the latest uh, operating system. So EI Suite's been very reliable on that operating system. So we, you know, the decision was made to, to go forward um, with that OS. Um, iPads, which is specific to the uh, smart source contract, um, those aren't available with uh, uh, Spectrum or Hartford. Uh, just a little review real quick on, on those devices. Um, there's still the single master restricted iTunes password. Um, if for some reason you need to install um, software from the, from the apps, uh, iTunes app, uh, you'll have to contact uh, smart source to get that key to do that, the passcode. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, however, you know I would definitely make sure that an app, you know, if there's an app out there, make sure you really need it. Um, uh, Non-restricted, which would just be the typical free apps, you can download as many of those as you want. Um, there's no issues. There's no password. Um, I guess when I say as many as you want, I, I would say make sure you download ones that are specific for the purpose of the fire, of course. Uh, the other one is physical security. I know that there were some issues on a few incidents where some uh, iPad devices came up missing. So as an ITSS, it's pretty important to keep an inventory of all those devices who has them and make sure that they, uh, they do get returned and sent back. Uh, the fire can purchase applications. Uh, if, if you're in a situation where they do want to purchase an app, you're going to have to get that restricted iTunes password from smart source um, and I would be very cautious about the uh, purchase card that gets used for that um, as an ITSS you know don't I would highly recommend don't use your personal credit card or something like that a lot of times uh, those machines end up with that kind of stuff cached on there and, and you could end up with kind of a little surprise when you get your next credit card statement so uh, make sure it's approved and and make sure that the you know the government card that's used for for any type of application purchases uh, moving on to the last item here uh, the ipads come with a data plan which is only five gigabytes for the month and as we all know as itss is five gigabytes is really nothing it's kind of a crumb i guess you could say in the uh, data world so uh, as soon as you can i would Highly recommend if there's any other DSLs or any other access points um, that those iPads can be connected to, that would be very good because that will definitely help uh, maintain that uh, five gigabyte data plan to those devices. Uh, going on to the next slide, um, you know, last year we had the, uh, the BPAs and the order forms on the FTP site, but uh, we definitely are looking at starting to use FireNet much more. So um, Eric has already uh, set up a, um, a FireNet area for us to start putting those uh, BPAs and order forms. Uh, those different contracts are currently still being negotiated and finalized at this point, so we don't have them. Um, I would anticipate probably late this month 
uh, maybe early April, those will start coming in and we'll have those finalized. But as they do, we will start to populate those um, with the updated ones so that uh, people can use those to get an idea of what the pricing is. And also the order forms are kind of useful to fill out, especially when you go to uh, per, uh, submit those to ordering, for instance. Uh, that is it for me. Um, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton to you. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. A reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit those through the control panel, and we'll address them at the end of this webinar. So moving right along, uh, Jennifer is going to walk us through the latest on incident IT security. Jennifer? All right. Thanks, Paul. All right, our favorite subject, security. Um, not much has changed in security, so most of this info is uh, pretty much the same from last year. Um, but from us going out in the field and noticing some of these, we just wanted to stress a lot of these uh, bullet points again this year. So right now, the approved operating systems, uh, this has changed from last year is we are approved for 7 and 10. They are both fully supported and fully IT, ITSS endorsed. All the rentals have been requested to come with Windows 10 Pro, but where they're still out there with the contracts, um, don't be surprised if some does come with Windows 7 Pro. So it is a possibility. Uh, check your current uh, versions and definitions uh, while you're on the network, and this is for your antivirus. Um, as long as you do it while you're on the network or at home on your own personal, um, all of this will update rather than taking the bandwidth out on the incident. We did notice some of those, and it would be really helpful if, if that's something you guys can uh, really look forward to or stress to the team. Uh, make sure your firewalls are enabled. Most of these are enabled by default. Um, all right, the next one, the public law. Uh, this is where Eric mentioned about FireNet. Uh, FireNet should uh, cover all of the issues that we've had with the public law, uh, but, but it reads disclosure requirements for official business conducting using non-official electronic messaging accounts. Meaning, if an officer or employee of an effective or an executive agency may not create or send a record using a non official electronic messaging account unless such office or employee copies an official electronic messaging account or email or forwards a complete copy of the record to the official electronic messaging account or email or what is recommended right now, just working through FireNet. Okay, next slide. All right, um, this has uh, stayed the same. Mostly uh, we're gonna stress the same points this year. Uh, we did change the location, obviously, of the security white paper. It is located now on FireNet. It's in the ITSS group library located under the Incident Computer Security Procedures Board folder. And the link is up there if you guys want to type that out. Uh, the white paper is still in draft, the same as last year. It was developed by the Fire IT leadership and is now, which, which is now known the program board. Um, we feel that these are the best practices across the board. And more work obviously needs to be done to finish the document and hopefully one day it will be done. So um, the next couple of bullet points are numbers of, of the issues or the, I'm sorry, the, the security points in this document that we want to stress. Um, all of the items in the document are, are obviously equally important, but we picked these same ones from last year because um, some of us have and notice uh, these issues a little bit more so last year, so we want to stress these. Uh, number three, or as yours is the first bullet point, all members must sign an authorized computer user acceptable use agreement document. Oh, that's a mouthful. Um, this form is ensured that each user has uh, knows their responsibilities as a user on the incident system. It's a lot like the rules of behavior form for DOI agencies and the Forest Service policy form. 
So uh, we would need those from each person that will ha that will be on the network. Each member will only need to sign one document each year, and the copies should be sent to your local GAC. When signed in the incident environment, the form should be filed to the incident documentation box. Okay, the next one is number 10, and it's to provide security, uh, physical security of the electronic equipment, meaning you must know at all times where your equipment is physically. Is it in your tent, your yurt, your sleeping bag, trailer truck? It's their responsibility to ensure that the equipment is accounted for or locked up. Uh, computer, servers, cameras, GPS units, iPads, iPhones, whatever. Um, that's their responsibility. Uh, the next bullet, number 11, account for all the equipment. Um, equipment logs shall be kept for all items. Uh, the minimum information that um, you should have on these is the item location, the responsible party, and the serial number to match the hardware. Uh, during transitions, all equipment shall be accounted for, and the receiving party shall find the equipment being transferred. If that doesn't happen, then the responsibility lies on us as IT. So if their name is on it, it's their responsibility. Uh, number 12, um, the personally owned equipment, uh, this seems to be the, the security issue that we see the most. And it is frustrating, as I'm sure most of you could tell us lots of stories of, of what has been brought uh, into your camp. Um, I can't stress enough that personally owned equipment is prohibited. Um, absolutely no privately owned equipment is to touch the incident network just as if you're at work. They can't touch our network. The public or the guest networks that you set up are not considered the incident network. So incident network is where your EI suite stuff and, and anything on that is about the incident. So we know that, they, that personal equipment is going to show up. We know that. We know and we've seen that individual um, equipment is even shown on the resource orders. Unfortunately, we don't have control on what goes on on the resource orders, but if it's private, you have the responsibility to not to make sure that that person understands that. That just because it's on there doesn't mean you get to use it on the incident. So you're not obligated to support any of those items, whether they're on the order form or not. So this includes smartphones, iPads, tablets, computers, GPS units. If they're missing a power supply, I think that was one they seen last year. Um, so they came and asked us for if they could borrow a power supply for their own computer. Um, that's not on us. So the incident is not responsible for unauthorized equipment that's brought and used on the incident. So if it gets broke, stolen, or whatever, it's their responsibility, not ours. And I know we all have those users that they bring their, their personally owned computer, or whatever, to work on off time, and they see us walk past and they say, oh, hey, you know IT, can you help me with this? Um, we've all seen it. Um, I did see it last year, and I and I felt bad because I just started laughing. <laughs> so we all have those. Um, just try your best to be professional, and you know, just let them know it is not your responsibility. So authorized equipment and computers uh, will be issued to you at the incident. Uh, your agency-owned equipment is only used if the incident approves it beforehand and is listed on your resource order, which 
we all know, um, check the agency's guidelines beforehand. So that's something you guys can look uh, for right now is make sure what the guidelines are for either DOI or USDA or your state or whoever. Um, let's just make sure that we're staying within those guidelines. The next one uh, is number 17 in that uh, security form uh, reporting and loss of data or equipment. Securing the network and safeguarding the data is the responsibility of us. It, it, it is. The ITSS can be held liable for the loss of equipment or data unless the security policy exists within the team or the incident. So if there is a loss of sensitive data or equipment on an incident, you must inform the IC and the general staff. The security manager will coordinate with law enforcement, et cetera, inform the agency in which the incident is reporting to. So if you're a BLM and you're on a Forest Service controlled incident, you need to report that to them. So they will activate the computer security incident response team if needed. Um, also, for federal equipment, you need to report it to your agency and follow. Those are rules for us and to help us. So go ahead, Paul. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Good job. That finishes our presentation this morning. Um, we'd like you to note the next slide. Stay informed that the IT support workgroup page on FireNet is a link to that page. Uh, next slide, please. Um, before we get to uh, closing out here, again, if you have any questions, be sure to type those in to the uh, control panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. After this uh, webinar ends, that of course will be closed. You're most welcome to contact any of the presenters directly, or um, in our next slide, we have an address for the uh, cadre at FireNet. Uh, remember to request your FireNet account if you have not done so yet. The uh, PowerPoint that we use today is actually posted on your control panel, and the little green arrow in the upper left, or, excuse me, upper right corner, about halfway down under handouts, you'll see a PDF version of the webinar slides that were used today. You're welcome to download those. The next webinar is scheduled, uh, it'll be pretty much exactly the same as this one, it's scheduled for April 11th. And that would be at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, so the same time as this one. And if no one else, uh, none of the other presenters have anything to add, we'll go ahead and oh. the next slide. Sorry, go ahead.
So real quick, uh, next question was, is Windows 8 approved? So um, as far as Windows 8, it, it, you know, the, right now the, the intent is to support Windows 7 and Windows 10. Uh, you shouldn't see anything different from the rental perspective. Uh, if you do see Windows 8 systems, it'll probably be from an, an agency perspective. A lot of the, you know, you might have an agency machine that comes out as a Windows 8. Uh, it's not disapproved in a sense, but we, we didn't really target Windows 8 from that perspective. But um, so I can't say that it's approved, but it's it's not uh, disapproved as well. It just depends on what you see out there in the in, at the incident. And like I said, if it's coming from a rental, you're probably not going to see it. But if it comes from an agency, uh, it might show up. Who knows? It'll definitely run on Windows 8.1 without any issue. The thing that you have to keep in mind with uh, Windows 8.1 is to make sure that you go into the uh, Windows features and turn off any IIS um, web services because typically that was on by default. Um, otherwise, that service, that web service will uh, have issues with Tomcat. They'll start to impede upon each other. So. If you are going to use Windows 8.1, make sure that the IIS is turned off. Okay. Next question is, do we have an official policy on wiping rentals before they go back to the company? So um, I have to go back, back to the white paper and see if it's in there. If not, it's probably a good one to add. Uh, if it's not an official policy, it's definitely highly recommended to, to wipe your system. The problem is we don't have a standardized software that we can uh, provide out to everyone. Uh, that being said, we have worked with SmartSource and the rest of the companies, and, and they understand that the, their typical procedure is to wipe those systems before they reload them again. So that's part of their contract. So, All right, let's see. Um, so can personal phones be connected to the Wi-Fi? So again, this goes back with to, uh, the use of personal devices. If it's the agency uh, network, if it's the uh, IMT network and not the guest network, then the, the uh, answer probably there is no. Uh, we don't want any personal devices on that network, especially because of the bandwidth utilization. And specifically, if you're in a satellite usage uh, type environment, that's going to be very costly at the government's expense. If it is a guest network and you do have the availability bandwidth through a DSL connection of some sort, um, then I'll leave it up to the discretion of the ITSS based on, on the conditions and connectivity and, and requirements. But as far as to that IMT network, uh, I would say uh, since it's a personal device, uh, I would say no. Okay. Um, hey, Eric. Yes, uh -huh. hey, Eric. I am looking through the security white paper and number 14 to answer the prior question about wiping the non-agency computers or the rentals. Um, it's number 14, so it does talk about um, wiping them and stuff. So you can you can uh, go there and look. Perfect. There you go. Uh, next question is more about FireNet and the FireNet chat. Does that work with Bison Connect? Yes, we, we're actually testing that um, functionality right now. We're having some users test the chat functionality between Bison Connect and FireNet. So you'll see that that, that is working uh, as we move forward. So that's a great question there. Um, so as far as uh, the personal use equipment and whether or not it's being commuted out to the field, you know, th that information has gone out to, to some of the, the GACs and, and uh, some of the groups out there. I need to find a way to, to communicate that a little bit better to uh, the dispatch community as far as uh, uh, when they resource order one, so someone out there. Because uh, it'd be great if they actually had on the resource order no personal devices, only federal devices or something like that. But I haven't been able to make contact with someone out there. I know this puts the ITSS in a difficult position a lot of times. Uh, but again, just pointing back to the policy and, and especially now since we had the uh, uh, 2017 OCIO meeting, it's very clear that this is a federal network, so just you need to follow the same procedures in a federal network in regards to the connection of personal and equipment to uh, or uh, government IMT network. Uh, let's see. Yeah, from as far as the responsible responsible uh, acceptance use form and who uh, should get that back to the GAC. Um, work through your specific IMT. Typically, you, you'll send it back out to uh, the dispatch center and then back out to the GACs, but it really depends on what's the pr procedure for each GAC. Each GAC is different about um, uh, how um, 
that information is, is passed back out to the GACs. Everyone has their own individual procedure. And then I just got a, a note that uh, it looks like somebody mentioned that uh, that unit ID for Minnesota will be added to the next uh, e-update I suite. So that's good news there. Uh, the rest of the questions that I have here I, I have, they have already been answered. So, Paul, I think uh, that wraps up the question session. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Um, that's something to adjourn. Thanks, everyone, for a really informative session. Again, you can contact the cadre at ITFS cadre at firenet.gov. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and a very safe fire season.